Uh, can you hear my voice? Sounds good. Yep. Oh, great. Okay. Okay. So you see our screen, or? Yep. Uh, if you just want to put it in a presentation mode, perfect. Right. Okay. So welcome everybody. I'm uh, Fidel Costa, and what we are going to do, and what we have been tasked, is to give an overview of subduction zones in Southeast Asia, and there will be four of us uh, speaking. I will start with a general overview of, I guess, very subduction zones and what we've been thinking or what I will be uh, telling you about is um, what are the main characteristics of some of the subduction zones around in this part of the world and give you an overview of what are the main features of earthquakes and what are the main features of volcanic eruptions. So here in this uh, slide here you see that there is some of the subduction zones can be quite complex, as you can see in the Philippines. We're not going to talk a lot about the Philippines, but here we have them. We have double subduction zones, and south of the Philippines we have Sulawesi and all these areas which have a very complex tectonic setting. Uh, so we're going to mainly be focusing on uh, Java and in, in Sumatra, and then later moving into Myanmar. So Java and Sumatra, you see they share, they share I would say, the same subduction zones so from the Sunda Trench. And the uh, first thing, uh, let's see. Um, so first thing that it's, uh, that we thought of is looking at what is the composition of the upper plate, so the continental uh, shelf. And here you see a map which is very approximate. We don't know a lot of details about what are these the different domains. We have mainly this uh, Sundaland, and maybe to the south towards Java, there's a change on the on the type of the crust. So basically, this is the main the main features. Just to give you a kind of a, yeah, overview. And then for the upper crust, we've been we had some work done by, the, by a PhD student in our volcano class, Sagar Murthy, and where he with you can see here, there's maybe a change on the continental crust, maybe south of uh, southern part of. Uh, Sumatra and toward Java, there is significantly older, older one more than one billion years, and going towards north, northeast, it gets increasingly younger. Yes, this might be relevant if we want to understand, for example, something about what are the variations of the volcanic rocks that are coming up in Java versus Sumatra. So, what's the effect of the upper plate? Next thing which is uh, relevant is what is the age of the subducting plate. And you can see also there's a range of ages going from northern part of Sumatra, starting at about 50 million years. And as we go progressively south, we have oceanic plate that gets older and older, up to about 150 million years. So in Java and Sumatra, we have this change of age in the subducting plate. And as you can imagine, this has significant effects, for example, on the subduction dip. But before we go to there, also an important thing is that you see that in Sumatra, we have an oblique subduction. 25 degrees to 35 degrees, and as we turn around toward Java, the subduction becomes frontal. So, in addition to the change on the age of the subducting plate, we also have a change on the angle. And of course, this gives rise in Sumatra to this um, to the Sumatran fault. Um, here is just a plot of uh, earthquakes from from this catalog and. You'll see, well, lots of earthquakes many places, but you can already start to see that many more earthquakes in Sumatra than in Java, but also that the depths of these earthquakes are quite different. Many more uh, deeper earthquakes in Java versus Sumatra, but many more earthquakes in Java and uh, in Sumatra, I mean. And so here we have a plot of what might be the subducting slab. How does this subducting slab change deep? With, uh, between Sumatra and Java, and you see that in Sumatra it's relatively shallow in accordance with its uh, younger age, and as we go towards uh, Java, the angle of subduction increases significantly, approximately going from 45 in northern Sumatra to about 70 in Java. This should have also significant effect on the types of volcanoes, volcanism, and, and seismicity. And if you look at this in another way, we can see that this is correlated with the depth of the slab, where we see how the depth of the slab changes from much shallower to significantly uh, deeper, that we can image here. 
Um, how does this translate as a basic statistics of earthquakes, uh, number of earthquakes and magnitudes of earthquakes? We can see, as I was mentioning before, many more earthquakes in Sumatra and of significantly larger magnitudes compared to Java. This is, of course, very young. Uh, this is a very young data set. You know, we don't know if this was in the past or not, but what we can say from what we see, you know, in the recent, whatever, 100 years, that this is the, the picture we get. And actually, roughly four more times earthquakes in, um, in Sumatra versus Java. Why this might be the case, I guess this could be one of the topics of the, of the subtraction zone. But here there were some authors that have proposed some interpretations. In Sumatra, they've proposed it's a much larger seismogenic zone that this can be locked, so you have many more earthquakes. This is related probably to the angle of the dip or maybe other features versus in Java where the steepest, uh, more steep subduction gives us a smaller uh, zone that can be locked, so less earthquakes. Also, other work that has been done is imaging of the accretionary prisms in both in Sumatra and Java, there is significant accretionary prism, and this is just to show you kind of the level of imaging that has been done, which it seems to me that it, it's quite good. So we know quite a few things about how the accretionary prism is here and whether it plays a role or not on the type of earthquakes we get. That's, I guess, to be discussed. So as a kind of first order summary of the introduction and seismicity, I guess if we, we've been focusing and comparing Sumatra versus Java, so there's a change between Sumatra and Java, which is quite significant on the age of the oceanic and continental plates. There's an oblique subduction and shallower angle in Sumatra versus Java. Many more earthquakes and of larger magnitude, but both have a significant accretionary prism that may play a role on this seismicity and earthquakes. So now we move on a little bit in, more into the volcanoes. There's lots of volcanoes. Uh, about 120 active volcanoes in Indonesia, many more in Java than in Sumatra. Philippines, about 40 active volcanoes. And this is just a reflection of uh, a number of active volcanoes. Here, classified a little bit, you see that there's different types. There might be open vent volcanoes, the most active ones. It's also calderas. There's a range of uh, different types of volcanoes that are probably reflecting also the different parameters from of the subduction zone. And just some basic statistics. For example, here you have in Java versus Sumatra, we have about 45 uh, active volcanoes in Java currently and 35 in Sumatra. This gives, because Java is much significantly smaller than Sumatra, this gives about twice as much density of volcanoes in Java versus Sumatra, so significantly many more volcanoes in uh, Java. And also these volcanoes are significantly more active. So we look at the 10,000 years of eruptions in Java, we have about 600 versus less than 200 in Sumatra, which gives 14 eruptions per volcano in Java versus 6 in Sumatra. Also, the range of uh, VEI, so large sizes of eruptions, many more larger eruptions in Java than Sumatra. Yes, the point of this statistics is to show that these two um, islands or Part of yeah, small continents have large differences in earthquakes and in, in volcanic eruptions. And because of the oblique subduction, so the, the way this is going is that we have the big Sumatran fault, and there's also other things to try to understand, relationship between the Sumatran fault and the volcanoes. Here we have some statistics about that shows in the lower left panel that there's many or most of the volcanoes in Sumatra are relatively close to the Sumatran fault, I would say closer than 20 kilometers, I would say 90% of them. There's one main volcanic front and versus in Java in the right side, you have many much more complex relationships within the faults and the volcanoes. And it's also apparent that in Java you have two volcanic fronts that here in red versus in Java where you have only one uh, to, uh, volcanic front. So it's different, more complex tectonics in, in Java than in Sumatra. Or yeah, different, different relationship between Java and Sumatra. An interesting thing, going a little into the geochemistry, is that in this part of the world, because there is all these there's two volcanic fronts, is one of the first places where this the so-called potassium or KH relation was proposed quite some time ago. So that it's also an interesting, I think, um, uh, reflection that yeah, this part of the world has also been used to propose 
relationship with the, the dip of the slab and the different types of magmas that are produced. There's been some more modern result, more modern studies, although not so many. It's very difficult to get to these volcanoes. There's a lot of vegetation, uh, so it's kind of difficult field work. But there's been some, uh, I would say, isotope geochemistry that shows that there's an effect of the subducting sediments on these uh, volcanic rocks, so that we see the signature from the subducting sediments, but we also see a significant signature of the upper crust, so a simulation of the upper crust, classically carbonates, there's a lot of limestones around, are also playing a role on the types of rocks that are erupted. Now, going a little bit, just to give you a kind of quick view that there's some more detailed studies that have been done, basically in geophysics, to, for example, image what's going on below the Toba volcano, and recently, recent paper, imaging how they imagine, imagine that there's melts and fluids that are leaving the slab, maybe because there's a change in slab dip, where you have here in the left side, implying maybe there's a kind of like a breaking of the slab, not so clear, but they related to the, to the uh, Toba eruption, and there's also few detailed studies, not so many, that have been done in very active volcanoes like Merapi, where they also, as you can see here in the lower panel, they propose that there are fluids that are coming out of the slab and going kind of diagonally, not really vertically, diagonally towards Merapi, and this may probably propose that it's a very active volcano. Next slide, it's less left over, we don't go into these details, it's, it's, it's fine, and so now if we just a summary of volcanoes and seismicity. You know, in Sumatra, there's half the number of volcanoes per kilometer in Java, so many less volcanoes. It's, they're much less active than in Java. There's two volcanic fronts in Java, only one in Sumatra. And they both show yeah, similar uh, inputs of sediments, either subducting or in the upper plate. Some first order uh, questions that one can think about this uh, Java versus Sumatra is that the difference in behavior in earthquakes and volcanoes has to be somehow related to the changes on the age of the slab, the dip of the slab, and the direction of the subduction. So I think that's a nice, seems to me, nice laboratory to test some of this. And I guess it gives a nice framework to test, you know, whether this different behavior, how it is related to a potential earthquake cycle or a, even a volcanic cycle, how these two cycles might be related. So basically that's my part, and then we're going to go over to Reno. My name is Reno Salman. I'm a third year PhD student, and I'm originally from West Sumatra. In this opportunity, I'm going to present scientific questions and emerging science opportunities in the Sumatra and Java subduction zones. First, let's move to Sumatra. Compared to Java, in Sumatra there are two unique tectonic conditions. The first one is an oblique convergence of the oceanic plate, subducting beneath the erosion plate, where the Sumatra island is sitting on. So, the perpendicular component of this oblique convergence is accommodated by the megatross and then much of the trench parallel component is accommodated by the Sumatran Fault, a 1900 kilometer long right strike slip fault. The second unique thing is the presence of four art islands above the megatrust. Since their locations is directly above the mega trust. It gives unique opportunity to study the behavior of the mega trust. In 2002, it was the first time uh, to install continuous GPS in four arc islands, and then it is keep growing. There are totally now 60 stations and they are has recently been maintained by both EOS and Lippi. In the next slides, I'm going to talk about earthquakes, both from recent earthquake and then past earthquakes, coupling rate, persistent barriers, and then slip events. 
So these are the two locations of the key points that I'm going to talk about. Simalu and Banyak Islands and also the Mentawai Patch, a 700 kilometer long patch from Sibiru to Engano. Much of the Sunda mega trust has ruptured in the last decade. There was one magnitude 9, three magnitude 8 in 2005, 7, and 12. And then the rest are uh, 15 of moderate earthquakes. Um, so based on USGS earthquake catalog, since 1907, there have been 282 earthquakes with magnitude larger than uh, 6 and then 44 percent of which occurred after 2000 and there were there are 30 events recorded by the sugar network and the cost seismic uh, offset estimations are available in this paper. Next I'm going to talk about past earthquake in Sumatra particularly in the Mentawai patch, so as the uh, the region is shown in this uh, red rectangle. So from coral micro atos uh, data, it shows that the Mentawai patch generates large earthquake sequence every about 200 years, and then the data also shows that two super cycles ended in grid doublets during the rupture in. 14 centuries and also 18 centuries and then one ended in a century of many large earthquakes as shown by the um, many colored polygon uh, here and then in the 21st century only part of the patch has ruptured in the current cycle uh, that was in 2007 so the next large earthquake in Sumatra will likely be in the Mentawai patch but we don't know whether it's gonna be a single earthquake as shown in the grid tablet or it will rupture piecemeal in stream. This map showing you a coupling map that was estimated based on um, both GPS data and coral data. The coral data went back 40 years ago. So the prominent result of this coupling map is there is a large long strike variations in coupling and also poor resolution south of minus 4 degree so south of this latitude and also near the trench there. So it is interesting to see that actually less coupling estimated near the trench but a magnitude 7.8 earthquakes in 2010 generated an outsized tsunami. In the next slide I'm going to show you an estimation of interseismic coupling based on coral data that was taken in this uh, similar island. So an Estimated of 1100 year paleogeodetic data reveals significant variations in vertical motion rates. What you are looking at here on the left and right panels are an example of um, variations in vertical motion rates from those 11 year uh, long record. Uh, this variation in the coral rates is actually can be explained by the changes in the depth. So if you see before 1819, there was a small subsidence there, but then it gets um, higher during this period. So uh, the variation, yeah, the variation can be explained by the changes in the depth as, as shown here. It is 35 kilometers and then goes to 55 kilometers. And then another interesting thing in this Simulu Island is also uh, persistent rupture barriers. If you see, as you can see here, the black one is the rupture area 
of 2005 earthquake and then the blue one is for 2004. But both ruptures terminated beneath central Simulu Island. The long record uh, coral data shows that this ruptured barrier has persisted over at least the past 1100 years during seven large ruptures. The cause of the barrier is still debated. So although this barrier stopped ruptures, but two magnitude uh, seven earthquakes have originated within the region of the barrier. Uh, there are questions remained left unanswered. They are, why are the barriers persistent and then how persistent they are? And also, why have they hosted moderate earthquakes. Next, uh, let's go to uh, slow slip events. So the idea of this is the sugar network record um, a decade long data and then um, the techno tectonic signal has been removed such as um, interseismic, co-seismic and after slip and then what left is a flat time series and then these show no clear evidence of slow slip events. So it is actually based on the short term data. It is only 12 years. What about if we go back to um, longer data from coral? It shows that here in Banyak Island, in this period, the uh, vertical motion went down but then during this period it went up. So there is a reversal from subsidence to uplift and then went down again. So after doing careful investigation, uh, Sang et al. found that this reversal may reflect um, a 15 year long SSE. On the bottom panel it shows moment duration uh, scaling relation from ED at all. And then once we plot uh, SSE, it shows that uh, SSE in this Banyak Island is the longest SSE ever discovered. Um, these are key points that I'm going to talk about uh, in Sumatra. Now let's go to Java Seduction Zone. So in general, Java has historically been more quiet compared with Sumatra. Um, the recent largest earthquake have been less than magnitude eight. And actually there were two moderate earthquakes occurred in 1994 and um, 2006, both ruptured uh, near the trench and triggered tsunamis. Um, the total orthogonal convergent rate uh, offshore, offshore Java is about 70, uh, 7 centimeter a year, but there's no known record of magnitude larger than 8 even in the past few centuries. As I talk in Sumatra about um, coupling, SSEs, and segmentation, but in Java, all these three are unknown. Before I finished my presentation, let me show you uh, what data would strengthen our existing efforts. The first one would be a GPS seafloor geodesy to better understand the whole process of earthquakes cycles, and especially in areas where our land-based GPS stations are too sparse or lacking together altogether, such as in Java. The second one is. Um, high quality seismic network, both land and marine based, to identify the whole family of the uh, earthquakes, such as non volcanic tremor, uh, low frequency earthquakes, and very low frequency earthquakes. And also to help map the geometry of the mega trust. The third one, uh, maintaining networks uh, over a long time is really important. It is as shown by our a uh, very long paleogenetic record that can reveal uh, how we can found uh, slow slip events and interseismic rate that vary over time. 
The last one, um, uh, bathymetry and seismic reflection are needed to reveal, to reveal, uh, reveal uh, important details about the subducting slab. They are also uh, needed to know more details about what features that control segmentation, partial rupture, and coupling. Um, these are all I have for my presentation. Thank you. Okay, so looks like it's now my turn. I'm Wang Yu, um, a research fellow in the Observatory of Singapore. So, um, previous uh, 30 minutes were this uh, fly through the tectonic situation in Sumatra and Java. And now I'm going to talk about, uh, just spend about 5 minutes or 10 minutes, talk about what happened in the latitude of Myanmar in the northern part of the Sanda subduction zones. So, um, if you look at this map, uh, all of the orange and red arrows are showing the uh, relative plane motion of the India and Australia plane relative to the uh, so-called stable Sanda plate. So one very um, clear pattern that we see here is toward the north that the, uh, the relative plate convergence rate between India and Sanda are getting lower and also the um, asthmas are getting more oblique rather than compared to the 30 degree or 45 degree in Sumatra. Here we are, uh, the first order play motion, relative play motion is like a 60 degree or larger. And in the frontal part that we see a lot of uh, curvature of the sub uh, subduction zone, we call it the uh, Rakhine's mega thrust. And in the back side, uh, the Sankai info basically play a very similar role to the Sumatra info. However, the distance between the uh, subduction zone and the Sangha info, which is a, a right lateral info, is much wider than the Sumatran info versus the Sangha subdu subduction zones. And between the uh, Sangha info and the Sumatran info, there's a spreading center that spread uh, with a rate about three million per year. And all these elements actually play an important part uh, constraining how the play convergence goes within this area. So the first thing we did in the past several years is we tried to map all the active fold in this area. And uh, after we map the active fold, we find out the condition is extremely complicated. That not only we have ongoing and equipment shortening and uplifting along the trench, but also we have a lot of the texture sharing fold that, that pop up in the interpermal range. ranch. And the later on, Mike will talk about one uh, very distinct example in the Fengdash areas. And uh, between the uh, Sankai fold and the Megathrust, we also see a lot of intraplate deformations that show on those, uh, the red thrust fold in the central Burma basins. And uh, toward the uh, Myanmar, Shan Plateau, uh, Yunnan, Golden Triangle areas, we see a lot of left lateral sharing happening in the northern part of the Sanda plate. So in fact, the northern part of Sanda plate is not played as a rigid plate, and uh, it's moving toward the Bangladesh side, which actually have some effect to the, the uh, conversion uh, of the mega thrust. And uh, in this figure, the, the lower uh, left-hand side is the sigmatic uh, cartoon showing how we think the deformation goes in this area, where along the, uh, in the frontal part, we have a, a, a looks like it's a, out of sequence thrust plus the, the normal subduction interface. And then we have some slip partitioning happening in the Indubar range as well as the Sangai fold. The other thing that very different to the Sumatran area is that the volcanic activity here is compared to relative uh, low. We have very few coronary uh, volcanoes uh, in the region of Myanmar. In fact, we only find three on land, which is a uh, plot of three red dots there. And only two has a record of uh, eruption, eruption during the uh, past million years. And uh, the recent geochemical analysis actually suggests those uh, coronary activity are not typical art volcanoes. So they, are, they have a lot of uh, signal related to the uh, extensions. And if we play the, the old school game like what people play during the G101, that the play uh, with all of these uh, sleep factors that in fact actually we see 
the uh, convergence across into one range are not that oblique. It's actually only about 30 degree that's showing on those red arrows. And those, all of those red uh, numbers are showing the, the range of the uh, plate convergence across the mega thrust. And toward the north, that uh, the, the upper one, that if we consider the northern part of the Santa plate actually moving to the west, then the uh, direction will be more not, uh, perpendicular to the change orientations rather than the super uplift the convergence. And the to the south, close to the NMC, that if we allow the NMC to be spreading at about three minutes per year, that's showing on those uh, uh, green dash lines. Actually, it also shows that it is the uh, uplift convergence rather than the strike slip boat. Um, all of these things actually reflect to the uh, background seismicities. If we look at the background seismicities, that all of the blue dot which shows a deep uh, slab earthquakes uh, occurred at a place where the, uh, the mega thrust starting to change its orientations. However, uh, when people look at those deep earthquakes uh, p axis, they start to uh, argue that the subduction is not active at all because the p axis is nearly parallel to the to the uh, to the slab rather than perpendicular to the slab. But if we look at the the, the p axis in the shallow part, there are still several that is perpendicular to uh, to the slab orientation, which suggesting that there are still convergence happening in the shallow part of the slab. And uh, the other major play uh, player in this area is a very thick sediment that are coming from the uh, Ganges rivers. That uh, compared to the Sumatra, here we have more than 50 kilometers thick of sediment actually now under thrusting to the Burma plates. Whereas in the Sumatra area, we are only expecting to have about one to two kilometers of sediment. And how this sediment acts uh, in the subduction zone, it actually create a lot of overpressure zones uh, within the uh, mega thrust. Uh, for example, these three uh, photos are taken uh, from the uh, model volcanoes in Burma which you can see they are very large, sensitive to any seismic event in, in nearby areas. And uh, their source are actually coming from the uh, under-thrusting sediments because uh, when uh, Greg Moore did the, the, the uh, uh, rock fragment, we find out those must be coming from the deep part. So there's also evidence of a mega thrust earthquake happened uh, in the past about 300 years. The last known mega thrust event here is a 762 earthquake, which produced about six meters uplift in one flood island offshore Myanmar. And we estimate its magnitude to be around 8.5 to 8.8, .8, and uh, with a permanent uh, coastal deformation happening in those islands. And uh, based on the uh, pattern of the uh, uplift terraces, we estimate the recurrence interval for this kind of mega thrust event to be about uh, 700 years. And uh, in the 19th century, British people actually left a, a quite good record about where uh, the land has been uplifted during the earthquake and where the land has been subsidenced during the earthquake. One uh, extreme example is the, the dot I plot in the, near the Chittagong area in the very northern end. At that place, that people has a document of uh, a cold seismic subsidence, and the land has, is keep subsiding after an earthquake indicate there are some post seismic deformations happening around that latitude. So what we did is that we tried to compare all of the survey results from our modern survey and the, the data from the uh, 19th century British people's record. And we find out uh, uh, we cannot simply explain the uplift pattern by using a simple uh, mega thrust model. Instead, this uh, double hum geometry and the high uplift up to eight meters of a coastal uplift can only be explained by the uh, mega thrust and the splay fold systems, just like the uh, uh, 1964 Alaska earthquakes. And uh, indeed, now they have a petroleum uh, industry uh, profile in this area that's showing that indeed uh, some of the splay fold are active rather than just the mega thrust system. And the low spray flow activity seems to be also create a permanent deformation uh, in those islands. So look at these two figures. There are two examples on uh, one of uh, two offshore islands. Basically, basically, we can see a flight of terraces 
that with the uh, coastal uptake rate up to about five millimeters to six millimeters per year. And uh, the high difference between the terraces are actually identical, indicates uh, those events are repeatable. So in summary, that in the Latio Myanmar, we see first order of three partitioning occur between the Arakan megathrust and the Sankai Info systems with the uh, active intraplate information between these two major play boundary folds. And uh, the play boundary system seems to be affected by the uh, fold extrusion in northern part of the Sana megathrust. That's why the, um, the vectors, play motion vector across the Bangladesh side is, has a little bit of uncertainties within that. And we have uh, very clear evidence uh, for the active uh, tectonics, uh, active uplift and shortening across the trench. So unlike some people's idea that subdu uh, the subduction has been stopped here, we actually see uh, clear evidence of active subductions. However, there are issues with the active subduction is that uh, the p-axis of deep earthquake in fact are parallel to the uh, subduction team slab and we have a very weak volcanic activity uh, in the quaternary time that indicate that uh, maybe the subduction uh, velocity is, is kind of very low in this area. Okay, so I guess I have to pass the uh, presentation to Mike. That's right. I'm I'm happy to do that. Let me uh, just select that. And Michael, you should see a pop-up window on your desktop any second now. Perfect. Let me turn my microphone back on. Yep. Can hear you loud and clear. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me start that. Okay. Um, mm. Representing a, a group of us that have been working um, in Bangladesh and Northeast India over the last uh, decade, and so talking about the very northernmost part of this uh, um, subduction zone. And, okay, so as you know, this is the uh, what we see is that the, the subduction zone continues, you know, all the way up, and when it hits the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta the subduction zone is entirely uh, subaerial um, and it's only north of the Shillong Plateau where you see the 1897 earthquake is where it's actually hitting cratonic Indian crust that even though it's uh, subaerial it still looks like it's um, oceanic uh, subduction. Uh, we also see some um, evidence from the uh, 1762 earthquake in uh, St. Martin's and Technoff, where the red circle is, of uplift of about two, two and a half meters from the 1762 earthquake. Um, and we have uh, three terraces and uh, tsunami deposits on, on the last one. Um, and then farther north in the uh, Bangladesh section, there's no historic record of, uh, of an earthquake. Um, we are trying to date right now um, an area of uplift in river revolt. Um, in the area of the uh, of the blue circle, um, so this is is one of the problems is there is the potential for an earthquake in the north, but there is no uh, historic earthquake yet. But this is, as you can see, one of the most densely populated areas on Earth. Um, so, you know, taking a, a step back for a second, what's happened is that India has has collided with uh, sort of the soft underbelly of Asia and pushed its way in and as it's done that um, Indochina has has wrapped around um, to the side so that while the Himalayas get a much more um, direct more perpendicular subduction in uh, along the Indo-Burma ranges you get a very oblique subduction with the uh, uh, that wrapping around a flow from from Tibet um, impinging um, on uh, on the subduction zone from from the back, perhaps increasing the uh, um, the subduction rate. Okay, so there's a, a very oblique subduction. Um, it comes in at about seventy degrees. Um, you know, Wang Yu already showed you the evidence of the earthquakes. It's not nearly as seismic as uh, 
farther south in, in Sumatra, but there is a good slab uh, with earthquakes down to about 160 kilometers with about a 50 degree dip. Uh, one thing that you do see if you look is that while the P axes tend to be north south, and you know there are various guesses and explanations, including compression from from the Himalayas, um, what you do see is good, very good down dip T axes in the in the slab that nicely rotate down the uh, down the slab as you look at the uh, earthquakes. Okay, and in addition to the slab earthquakes, you can also see there's there's quite a lot of very diffuse seismicity in the entire region. Okay, and part of what's happened is that in in this area um, is that the uh, the subduction zone is in the process of of colliding with the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta. So the Ganges and Brahmaputra um, drain about three quarters of the Himalayas and uh, over a, a billion tons of sediment a year. Um, that's on the order of currently six to eight percent of the world sediment supply um, and as a result the hin zone of the continental margin of India um, runs through Calcutta and up to the Shillong Plateau and the sediment has simply prograded that by uh, several hundred uh, kilometers and in fact the the active delta front um, on the shelf is prograding at 12 to 15 meters per year um, so looking at uh, receiver functions and SP conversions, now we have uh, estimates that the sediment thickness uh, goes up to about 19 kilometers of, of sediments, um, and the crustal thickness looks like on the order of 10 to 16 kilometers. It looks like uh, um, it's either thin continental crust or perhaps somewhat thickened oceanic crust. Um, there are seaweed dipping reflectors imaged in uh, in seismics here and is the suggestion that um, this during rifting was influenced by the 90 East Ridge Kerguelen hotspot and so it may be in the shallow part uh, somewhat volcanically thickened uh, crust that's subducting and then presumably as you go into the slab it is uh, normal oceanic uh, crust still going. Um, so the subduction zone has to cope with this huge amount of uh, of sediment. Let me just mention for a second in front of the Himalayas you can see the uh, Shillong Plateau which is a, a two kilometer high um, uh, anticlinorium and what we think is happening is this is where the hin zone of the margin um, comes and it's the first place where the hin zone of the backside of India is approaching the uh, uh, Himalayas and as a result the Himalayas are beginning a uh, forward jump to the Shillong Plateau and right now a GPS suggests about seven millimeters a year convergence between uh, uh, the Delta and, and Shillong suggesting about a quarter of the motion of the Himalayas has shifted forward to, uh, to Shillong. Um, as a result of all this uh, sedimentation coming in um, the Indo-Burman ranges um, has built the world's largest giant accretionary prism. Um, so our estimate of the actual active part of the accretionary prism that is actively deforming is over 200 kilometers uh, wide uh, with a lot of uh, anticlines and, and, and deformation that we are mapping out and the frontal part of that, the front, front about 60 kilometers um, is blind and buried by the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta, but the uh, the actual defamo deformation zone extends all the way uh, to Dhaka, about halfway across the delta. Um, so Paul Betka and Nano Sieber have been busily uh, mapping um, the stratigraphy and the and the structure in in this area, uh, where what we see is a coevolution of the um, uh, Brahmaputra and the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta and the uh, and the fold belt um, both prograding and deforming uh, together and so that now in uh, in Northeast India uh, we have these uh, periodic beds that you see in the uh, lower left 
Some of them we see, you know, 50 meter sections where we think we're seeing annual varving um, that corresponds to the uh, uh, the delta front, and the uh, and we also see a number of deposits um, that are. Um, evidence of a, a very large paleo river where the scale of the four sets is very similar to what we see on the current um, Brahmaputra River. So we think we see the um, uh, progradation of the of the delta ahead of the fold belt and being incorporated into the fold belt as you go. It also means that um, all of the deposits here are very time transgressive. Um, and so you cannot use the formations in order to constrain the, the ages because the entire system is prograding. All of the faces that you see here um, in exposure are also being deposited currently. Okay, so here is a, a, a very preliminary uh, section. One of the things that is, is happening is that because we have a, such a thick set of sediments, that it's overall a shallowing upward section going from um, deeper water uh, shales to shallower water um, shelf and, and fluvial sands as the uh, delta prograde's is that the lower part of the section is, is heavily overpressured and we think that when the detachment um, initially forms, it forms along the boundary between the overpressured muds and the um, and the somewhat stronger uh, sands. So as a result, we see uh, uh, the Colomont that's detached at, at three to five kilometers in the in the outer part of the prism, um, and there are you know dotted conjectural dotted lines, but we have uh, no constraints on the deeper part of the uh, of the structure. We know that as it goes along. Um, eventually you have to strip off all the sediments and transfer them from the lower incoming plate into the upper plate um, but we cannot uh, see the uh, deeper part of the uh, structure due to this uh, duplex system uh, where the surface structures are uh, related to the um, deformation above the, uh, the shallow detachment. Um, we also just want to point out um, the significant break in slope that we see that the outer part of the uh, accretionary prism which is the part that we see where we see active where the folds are getting progressively shorter across it um, has a topographic slope of about a tenth of a degree um, on average um, and that implies that the detachment surface has to be extremely weak. We also see that the folds are very much showing um, east-west um, shortening, uh, reflecting the partitioning that's going on between the shortening and the strike-slip components. Okay, and we also see a, a major, what may be a, a, a major out-of-sequence thrust in the Caladan um, fault, where the uh, where there is uplift, where the uh, erosion level is considerably um, deeper to the east than it is to the west. Okay, so uh, we've looked in, in detail more at the at the GPS, so here's a uh, GPS velocities relative to uh, India. Uh, we've just published this uh, recently and you can see, well, several things. One is you can see the, the southward motion of the Shillong Plateau that I mentioned, but you can also see the uh, convergence direction rotating as you come across, as you cross several uh, faults that have strike-slip components, um, leaving you with a, a much more perpendicular motion as you approach the deformation front. And you can see the deformation front actually is slightly farther west than in this uh, section, but it is um, extends far into the, uh, into the delta. And then as you go across to Shillong, there is a big offset. So the deformation front in Bangladesh continues into the Naga fold and thrust belt, where there is uh, Cretonic India um, involved in the collision, whereas the Dauki fault at the front of the Shillong 
uh, massif actually continues ahead, and we can see some evidence of it continuing in the subsurface in the in the GPS and in the topography, um, so that we actually in that um, boundary area have two overlapping, oppositely verging thrust systems. But if we take a look uh, at the part through the middle of the uh, Indo-Burma ranges, um, what I've done is is taken the GPS velocities and split that into the um, a long strike, strike slip component and the um, shortening um, fault perpendicular, um, subduction perpendicular motion and this is the, the result. If you look at the, the lower data from the dextral part, what you can see are several um, major um, strike slip faults. The uh, Sagain fault is obviously the bigger one taking up about half the motion but there has to be along the Kaba fault some um, strike slip component, although there is no GPS constraint, and the Chiraktronpo Mao fault has about 10 millimeters a year. Meanwhile, the uh, shortening component, we see a, a, a very good fit to a, a locked seismic zone, and there's um, two models in here one putting all of the motion on just the detachment, and one is splitting. Uh, a component into the Kaaba fault and the rest on the Indo Indo Burman range. Uh, so, you know, if you take a look, what you see is that the uh, um, the overall India Shan Plateau motion is split up with uh, several faults taking up uh, the strike slip zone uh, with the leftmost, sorry, rightmost. Uh, double-headed arrow um, showing where the uh, strike slip component is in mostly towards the hinterland and that leaves uh, the lock zone of active subduction uh, with 13 to 17 millimeters a year of subduction with an obliquity of about uh, 20 degrees uh, so very similar to the the level of, of partial uh, partitioning that you see in in normal uh, subduction zones and we think uh, that this zone uh, with the evidence of locking is capable of an earthquake of at least an 8.2 uh, depending on exactly when it ruptures and how far it ru ruptures. For instance, it's, it's very unclear whether or not um, a rupture would extend all the way to the deformation front or stop um, farther west. We don't know enough about the frontal part of the deformation zone to know whether or not it's developed enough um, to be seismogenic in these nascent uh, folds. Okay, so to summarize the, the geodesy is that the, the Burma platelet up here is not rigid. We have at least three major strike slip faults going across the uh, uh, Burma platelet. The strain partitioning is reducing the obliquity from about 70 to 20. Uh, and as I said, there is partitioning with the strike slip fault in the east and the shortening towards the, towards the trench. Um, as uh, Wang Yu said, there is very limited uh, volcanism. Um, there's three major active volcanic fields um, that that's going on, and and one some of the major questions are: Is that the limited volcanism because of the relatively slow rate of of subduction, so that you have limited downward transport of water? The other thing is that because we have such thick sediments coming in. Um, it looks like the lower part of the sediments are very likely um, metamorphosing and dewatering even before they reach the subduction zone and certainly in the early part of the subduction zone so it is entirely in, in possible that by the time you scrape off all those sediments into the accretionary prism there is actually very little water transported into the subduction zone and the subduction zone is, um, is actually relatively uh, dry so there's so there's very limited um, evidence on the uh, on the volcanism so um, over here Mary Kai has taken the data published in uh, it by Moriette et al um, so in the bottom you can see that um, single is is volcanic field is uh, not subduction related, but we have Mount Papa, Maniwa, and then there's another one further to the to the north. And the uh, evidence looking at the geochemistry suggests that 
Um, this may well be sort of relatively hot and, and dry, suggesting that there may be very little water being transported down the subduction zone. And I'd also like to point out that with a giant 200 plus kilometers accretionary uh, prism, um, the distance between the deformation front and the volcanoes is huge here. It's on the order of 500 uh, kilometers. Okay, so a very uh, broad zone. Uh, so I just want to point out, um, and summarize by mentioning in this you know overall system going from uh, Java up to the Indo-Burman Indo ranges, we have a, a set of 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 zone segments that have uh, a, a tremendous variations in uh, convergence velocity, the age of the incoming oceanic crust. Um, in the obliquity and partitioning, in the sediment entering the subduction zone and the and the volcanism. So I'd actually make the, the case that this is a really excellent place to focus on because you can get a, a tremendous variation um, in the properties of the subduction as you go along um, this very active uh, subduction zone. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, thanks to our speakers. Uh, I think we'll move into the questions phase. I have a couple uh, questions and comments that I've already received, and I would encourage uh, if you have one that you want to submit, uh, please type it into the box now. Uh, yeah, at yesterday's webinar, there were some good seeding questions that uh, the organizers for that provided. So I think I will uh, just read three of those out real quick just to give people in the audience a little more um, thought about the kind of input that we're looking for for the workshop. Uh, question one would be, what are the most compelling science opportunities that you see for an SEO in this uh, region? I think the three sp or four speakers just highlighted uh, a lot of those, but uh, you can think about, think about what's compelling science that could be looked into more. The second question would be, what sorts of capabilities, data sets, and infrastructure are still needed? And the third would be what kind of international uh, partnerships uh, for proceeding with this research would be advantageous. So uh, keep those in the back of your head. And uh, while you do that, I'm going to read a question from uh, Sagar Masuti. And uh, Sagar writes, and, and this was uh, fairly early in the webinar, so I think it was in reference to one of the first talks. Um, since south of the Mentawai patch ruptured in two events, 2007 and 2010, the two events were different, 2010 being shallow and 2007 being deep. Based on the coupling map, what can you say about the north Mentawai patch? Um, okay, I think this question is for me. Uh, can I start? Uh, yeah, answer now. Okay. Um, so based on the coupling map, um, as I said before, that actually the half certain part of the Mentawai patch has been broken during the 2007 and 2010, uh, but then not for the half uh, northern part. So um, based on the Super cycles earthquake that um, uh, coral microethyls data shows that um, uh, actually the pattern of the ruptures is kind of start from um, either north and then propagate to the uh, south or started from south propagate to the north. So uh, regarding your question about uh, the northern part of the mental patch. Um, it uh, will likely be that um, the next great earthquake will be there in the northern part, but actually it can rupture in one large earthquake uh, uh, covering only the northern part, but also maybe it will also cover the southern part because during 2007 earthquake, uh, the maximum, the peak maximum, Maximum cost seismic slip is seven meter, but that only cover a very tiny area. So the rest of the the rest of the southern part is uh, still uh, locked. So 
there are two possibilities, either um, single earthquake covering only the northern part or covering both the northern and then uh, part of the southern. Or um, the second uh, possibility will be maybe uh, in, term of, in term of a single large earthquake, it will be uh, kind of uh, the second uh, rupture style in the 16th century that will rupture in Ismail. Um That's 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 what I want to say. Okay, thanks. Um, all right. So next question is uh, submitted by Joan Gomberg, and Joan asks: uh, Has the record of turbidites been examined, and if so, what does it show? Which part of turbidite? Uh, when this was asked, I think she was referring to the uh, Sumatra region. No, so far I know um, there's no um, no good study on the turbidites in the Sumatra region. Mm -hmm. And uh, as for the Myanmar area, uh, because now uh, all of the oil companies are doing the 3D seismic along the offshores. And uh, from their 3D seismic, they do see a very frequent uh, uh, turbulent deposit uh, in which they are, uh, those oil people are seeing about those turbidite deposits are associated with a strong shaking event. Yeah. Um, I know that um, I guess farther east of Java in the Lombok Basin, there is a, uh, an image, a long record of, of turbidites accumulating in the basin. I don't know how much they've been dating. In, in Bangladesh, on the continental shelf, in the uh, forsets, uh, the group had, from Bremen um, have imaged a lot of um, homogenites of, of uh, transparent regions that they associate with uh, um, deformation from, from earthquakes um, and have tried to, to correlate some of these to, to earthquakes. Um, you know, we know that the swatch of no ground Canyon is 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 very active, um, but I don't know if thing people have been able to to correlate individual events to earthquakes or, or that there's been very much uh, work on that up in the northern bay of Bengal yet. Okay, thank you. Um, so next question would be from. Donna Blackman and Donna asks, what evidence for magmatic intrusion in Indo-Burma, what is the evidence for magmatic intrusion in the Indo-Burma region? Could volcanic material be presenting a biased view if most magma does not extrude? Oh, maybe I can comment. I guess, uh, you know, that's a difficult question. We don't know what might be coming below the, this part of the wall and it's true that the volcanoes could give a skewed view of what is happening. I mean, if this is very thick and we're not, we're not letting uh, many things to erupt, we could have a skewed view of this. I think for me, this part of the world is still, you know, it's, it's not understood why there's less volcanism. It's not clear. I mean, we've discussed some possibilities. But, uh, yeah, there's a lot of things to be done, actually, to figure out why, why is this going on like this. Yeah, I agree. There's, there's a lot more to be done to try and 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 do it to bring in modern um, techniques into uh, into Myanmar and do a lot more work. I have a question from Jeff McGuire who asks, "What are the general plans for expanding the observatory infrastructure in the Menatawai Gap, and what is most needed from international collaborators?" Um, so, uh, although all the prisons for art now covering the region of the Mentale Gap, um, but not uh, near the trench, and also not um, south of uh, minus 40 degree, uh, uh, actually um, a start from South Bagai to Engano Island. So we don't know a lot of information there um, in the south and also near the trench. So um, the earthquake in 2010 near the trench 
uh, we have an, an, a question about that earthquake actually I mean the style of the earthquake whether that the same type of earthquake could happen along the strike so we don't know so I think the uh, the most benefit uh, international collaboration there um, maybe we uh, could collaborate about what type of another data that can we used in uh, uh, in order to better understand the uh, current status of the Mentawai patch um, uh, whether this is seafloor geodesy or uh, another type of data um, yeah uh, this is important since um, uh, there are many things that uh, we don't know about the uh, coupling uh, ratio uh, since um, even though the coupling map has been estimated but then uh, much of the stress uh, I'm sorry I'm, I'm saying that uh, part of the stress has been uh, released in 2007 so we don't know whether uh, the the certain part uh, has released all the stress or not or the certain part will uh, still likely be uh, uh, included or participated in the next rupture earthquakes. All right, thanks. Um, so there were a couple comments, uh, one from Aaron Meltzner and another from Anil er Ernest about uh, existing turbidite studies. Uh, so Aaron uh, pointed out, uh, Aaron and Anil both pointed out a paper that came out in Geosphere uh, last November by uh, Jason Patton, who looked at a 6,600 year history of uh, earthquakes in the rupture area of the 2004 earthquake. And then in addition, uh, there was a study, um, uh, study done in uh, the Bay of Bengal more of a reconnaissance survey uh, and that, I'm not sure what journal this was in, but uh, that was referenced as well. So um, there's a couple studies out there. Um, with those two notes, I don't have any other questions. So maybe um, maybe we'll just take a moment. If, if anybody has any more, they can uh, submit those now. If there's any additional comments from the organizers, uh, sort of summary remarks, I don't know if, if anybody has anything they want to say, but uh, you're welcome to at this point. Sorry, I didn't mean to put anybody on the spot. Uh, I think I think with that, then uh, you know maybe we'll we'll end here. Uh, I think it would be good if, if people in the audience, if you have any other comments or questions that you send an email, um, you know, I know, uh, I think everyone who's on, uh, who's presented today will be going to the workshop. And uh, if you contact them with your thoughts on anything that's been presented, they can be part of the uh, part of the synthesis that uh, is presented uh, during the workshop on, on this webinar. And, uh, let me thank all of the speakers again. Uh, you guys did a great job, and I know none of you are really, uh, you're, you're, not that you're not at 100%, but you've all been traveling or up late. So uh, thanks again for making the time to participate.